aardvark, an animal of southern Africa. Dutch colonists gave it its name, which means earth pig, because it resembles in some respects the pig, and because of the amazing efficiency with which it can burrow into the ground. The reputation of the aardvark as food for humans is good. It is commonly described as tasting like pork. A few years ago, I was given this book for Christmas. It's called The Oxford Companion to Food. It was written by a man called Alan Davidson, and it's an encyclopedia of everything that a human being can eat, from aardvark to zucchini. Now, when I first got it, I thought, this is great, perfect for a hobby cook and extremely greedy person like me. But over the weeks and then the months, I found myself becoming increasingly fascinated by it and drawn again and again to leaf through its many entries and enjoy all this incredible, extraordinary detail. And I gradually realised that this is actually far, far more than just a food reference book. Eyes of certain animals and fish are considered a delicacy in some culinary cultures, but regarded as horrifying morsels by most people in the Western world. In Laos, the eyes of the giant catfish of the Mekong are among the most highly esteemed parts of this highly esteemed fish. Now, in the space of that one short entry, you've learned about history, geography, culture. And I think that goes to the heart of what makes this book so special. I think what Alan Davidson created in his eccentric, freewheeling, intellectually curious, erudite way was nothing less than a kind of portrait of the whole human race in all its ingenuity, told exclusively through stories about the food we eat. To find out more about this remarkable book and the man who wrote it, I'm following in his globe-trotting footsteps. The journey will take me to the shores of the Mekong River in Southeast Asia to sample some of the culinary delights of the remote country of Laos. OK, I'm going to try the skin of a buffalo. Hmm, it's like a sort of buffalo-flavoured jelly baby. <laughs> but there have been some interesting taste experiences nearer to home as well. I've also encountered Alan Davidson acolytes eagerly turning vegetables into musical instruments. And I've met some of his most ardent admirers. It is the greatest book in the English language. I, 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 I don't mince my words. I think it's absolutely wonderful. We're very pleased. It took Alan Davidson 20 years to write The Oxford Companion. But that's not the only extraordinary thing about his career as a food writer or his life. He had also once been a British ambassador. Well, I had a career as a diplomat. <laughs> and I, finished I couldn't interview the man himself. Alan Davidson died in 2003. So if I'm going to build up a picture of him, I'll have to do it by talking to his friends, family and some of the many people he's influenced. I'm starting in London, where, just as in Alan Davidson's book, the range of cuisines spans the entire globe. I've come to meet the celebrated New Zealand chef, Peter Gordon, who cooks with the same spirit of freedom and culinary curiosity that you find in the Oxford Companion to Food. So, Peter, thank hey. you very much for having me. Pleasure. Uh, tell me if I'm in the way. I've never been in a restaurant kitchen before. OK. Um, I'm here really to find out what you think of Alan Davidson's book. Well, I think his book is probably the best reference book, food reference book. A lot of people, I think, when they think of the book itself, they think it's going to have recipes and stuff, and it's remarkable that it has none. It's, um, for me, the sort of food that I love to do, I would love to collect things from around the world. So our ingredients are from the Middle East, from North Africa, from Southeast Asia, and it's all the places that Alan loves. You know, there, there's a... There, some chefs to whom this book would mean absolutely nothing, you know, but we don't mix with those sort of chefs. And then there are <laughs> chefs like ourselves who are inquisitive and we, you know, we appreciate the world of food. I've assembled an array of odd ingredients. These are long pepper. This one here is the miso. I've got bonito. It's a mackerel tuna family. Star anise. Other ingredients that Alan talks about are lotus root. This technique of combining ingredients from around the world, 
fusion cuisine has transformed cooking today. Peter Gordon was one of its pioneers. It's a tree fungus. And Alan so Davidson's book nice could body. be described as the Bible of the movement. And this is what Alan says seems to be the, the purpose. Actually, you could even grab in there. It says the purpose of squid seems to be... Maybe I'll... Shall I see if I can... Yeah, I've, I've I'll find marked squid. a few pages. Oh, you've there. marked it? Okay, yeah. I'll find it. I'll find it. <laughs> the architecture of squid is simple. All squid are remarkable in one respect. The processes of natural selection have operated on them in a manner which suggests that fitness for being stuffed by cooks in kitchens was a criterion for their survival. <laughs> and that's, that's what I love about it. You know, he's got, it's, it's one man's take on food. I'm going to poach these. I'm going to put these in now with the lotus root. Let's go in here. And we'll slice some rings. Knowing you were coming today, I wanted to see what Alan had to say about squid, and he talks about a, it's almost like a type of squid noodle that's eaten in, I think, in northern Japan. Do you want to eat some raw squid? Yeah, thank you. Raw squid. Mmm, that is fabulous. Eating Peter's homage to the Oxford Companion is a bit like munching on the book itself. Mm. That's sensational. It's the whole world brought together on a plate. No wonder a chef like Peter sees Davidson almost as a kind of food guru. This man spent 20 years writing what I think is probably the most important food book that I've ever read. You know, this man who came from the diplomatic corps who had quite an intriguing life. He became my hero and I'm someone who's kind of considered a bit of a rebel in food and I'm it's always fascinated me that someone from his background and someone from my background could have so much in common. So I, I just, I mean, he's a hero, it really is. A large part of Davidson's genius as a food writer is his tongue-in-cheek style, filling what could have been a rather dry textbook with exotic detail and wry reflections on life. Dragonfly, a kind of insect which is eaten in many Asian countries. In Bali, children caught dragonflies by holding latex-tipped poles higher than the places where dragonflies were perched. This induced the rank-conscious dragonflies to fly up and land on the tip of the poles where they became stuck. Thus, among dragonflies, as among other and larger species, excessive consideration for rank may spell doom. Above all, it's the sense of boundless curiosity that makes the Oxford Companion so fascinating, not only to food aficionados, but to anyone with a taste for the obscure, the surprising, or the downright weird. Which is why I've come to see John Lloyd. Oh, hi, Andrew. Come in. Hi, John. Uh, have a seat. Thank uh, you. He's the creator of the TV quiz show, QI. John, I mean, I'm, I'm curious to know about, about your relationship with Alan Davidson. Is it purely through the book? It's purely through the book. He's a kind of... Alan Davis is kind of the patron saint of QI, really. <laughs> the, the inside of QI that very few people have ever seen are called the QI databases. So what you do is you type in the three-letter code OCF, Oxford Companion to Food, and you go find next. And so here we are. All fats are composed of crystals, under crystals. And then you've got, uh, in Denmark, Danish pastries are called Viennese bread. Um, and then we've got... <laughs> oh, this, this is actually in the pilot. What is eaten in the city of Genoa that is generally not eaten almost anywhere else in the world? It's a delicacy in Genoa, nowhere else is it eaten. Um, God, pasta Genovese. Genovese. Yeah, little no, baby seals. No, no. Close, close. Baby seals. It's a Otters. mammal, it's a Otters. mammal. Otters. Baby dolphins. Dolphins is the right answer. Oh, I'm afraid the Genoese please. do. They enjoy chewing on strips of dried dolphin flesh known as mushami. Every single spread in the book is like that. So what have we got here? You know, warthogs. Um, <laughs> It says, warthogs, this may be cooked in any of the ways suitable for pork, but it does not taste like pork. Isn't that marvellous? Every reference book should be like this. If this were the national curriculum, you know, if at the age of five children went to school and they started with aardvark pate and worked their way through to whatever it is, zebra sausages, that by the end of it they would be as well educated as an 18th century savant. You probably know this book better than, than almost any other of its many, many readers. I honestly think, apart from T.S. Eliot's Four Quartets, 
with which this, this is a match for. It is the greatest book in the English language. I, I, I don't mince my words. I think it's absolutely wonderful. Spam, a canned meat product that came to the fore in the Second World War, having been devised by the Hormel Company in the USA in 1937. A competition was held for a catchy name, and the $100 prize was won by the entry Spam, indicating spiced ham. Spam has retained some popularity in various parts of the world, or they're regarded with disfavor by those who eschew processed foods or have pretensions to gourmet status. The idea that all foodstuffs have cultural value, that they're all equally interesting, well, that was essential to Alan Davidson's philosophy. Now, in the 20 years that it took him to write The Oxford Companion to Food, he very rarely spoke about his work. But he did give one radio interview in 1993 where he spelt out his approach. Haute cuisine, as they call it, is something I avoid. I'm far more interested in what uh, ordinary people eat. And I'm far more interested in producing information about say, uh, cookery in Latin America or Africa or Southeast Asia than in adding to the already enormous pile of material about, say, cookery in France. I mean, there's no problem for anybody finding out about that. Uh, I'm keen to add to the sum of human knowledge rather than just repeat. Adding to the sum of human knowledge had larger implications than you might imagine because the Oxford Companion to Food was really just part of a much larger project. One that I think of almost like a stone dropped into a, into a pond with ripples spreading out in all directions, but above all into academic life because it was Alan's big idea, perhaps his biggest idea of all, that food studies was a subject just as worthy of, of real intellectual discipline as history or any other of the established academic disciplines. So I'm on my way to Oxford to see how the Davidson philosophy has been brought to life. I'm going to the Oxford Symposium on Food and Cookery, which is being held this year at St Catherine's College. The event began in 1979 as a series of seminars organised by Alan Davidson and the historian Dr Theodore Zeldin for a handful of like-minded individuals. Now it's an annual event, attracting academics and food enthusiasts from all over the world. This year's symposium opens with a talk about the symbolism of vegetables in Western literature. In Shakespeare, the Welsh uh, comic character Flewellyn embodies uh, a real passion for leeks, for vegetables, also with the body tradition of seeing vegetables as something kind of, of genital. But this barely scratches the surface of the specialist knowledge and original thinking that has made this event so popular among committed foodologists. You get a wonderful sense of the breadth of the proceedings of the Oxford Food Symposium from the index of the various papers that have been published over the years. They include beans for the dead in the culture of Ecuador, Irish seaweed revisited, and the immortal The Rise of the Souffle and the Rise of Feminism in 1960s America. This year, the theme is vegetables. I'm particularly looking forward to the lecture on the role of vegetables in the conquest of space.